when you die, Jesus, like, does your soul just lay at rest until Jesus comes back? Because we always say, like, they're in heaven and they're happy, but are they really in heaven? Or does their, do they just feel like it's a split second between from when they die to when Jesus comes back? And I'm referring to 1 Thessalonians. Now, just a second. I'm too far away from that monitor, and I can't hear the next thing you're saying. I'm not even sure that monitor's on, but I'll listen anyway. Say that last thing again. Two verses at what? <laughs> that is an awfully large Bible. I know. And I have so many different versions. Mm-hmm. which says, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Yep. That's their bodies. Um, the dead in Christ will rise first. That's good. And uh, uh, then we'll add into this, John 5, 28. Um, Marvel not, for those in the grave will hear his voice and come forth. And then um, um, 2 Corinthians 5, which actually says, to answer your question, um, the, the scriptures do not teach soul sleep, nor does it teach uh, limbo. Limbo. Um, boy, this thing doesn't like me being on the side. Uh, limbo. Uh, the idea of, of uh, the body and spirit being joined together during life, the body, as it says in Ecclesiastes, here's another one, Ecclesiastes, it says that the, that the body goes downward into the grave, oh, man, and the spirit goes up to God. So right from the beginning, um, and even in Job, I mean, there's so many verses about this, I'll just run them together, but the short one is this. Uh, for every human being, the instant of death there's a separation between their, their material and immaterial part. The soul or the spirit is the non-physical part of us. The body is the physical part. And the body goes right back to the ground from which God made it. But the soul goes to the place that the creator determines. And uh, as long as we're on this, we might as well just keep going while we're talking. So where did you go? Where did you land? Oh, right there in the middle. Okay. Oh, are you a Hinkle? I didn't hear your name. Oh, well, I wondered where that, that was a thick Bible. Um, here we go. Uh, several, several points. One is that, um, that we are uh, spirit and uh, body or flesh, and the body uh, will go back to the ground, but it will be reconstituted. In fact, we might as well start looking at... Uh, Let's start looking at some of the verses on this. Look at John 5. Um, and Jesus, I mean, the, the Jews were very much uh, interested in this, just like we are. And Jesus said, uh, one of the ways you know who I am, John 5, 28, I am so powerful, Jesus said in John 5, 28. Don't marvel at this, for the hour is coming in the which all who are in the grave will hear his voice. Grave is uh, the concept in the Old Testament of Sheol and Hades. Uh, Hades. Hades, Sheol, also it's called the pit. This is the dwelling place of the n eternal, non-material part of people. Go to this place, everyone, everyone up until the cross went to the same place. They went to this this resting place where they were conscious, the grave. Uh, that's where David said he was going with his uh, uh, child of Bathsheba that died. But Jesus said, everybody in the grave can hear my voice, and they will, verse 29, come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. So Jesus is saying, I can speak to the people that are in the grave. But now, turn to Luke 16, go back a book. In Luke 16, I really believe that this is not a parable. Because Luke 16, Jesus' parables 
never have anybody named. Nobody's named. It's just a certain this, a certain man. All of a sudden, in Luke 16, uh, Jesus starts talking in there about a rich man in verse 19 and someone named Lazarus. And so this, this isn't a parable because no parables of Jesus 30 did he put people's names in. This is Jesus explaining for the first time for us to understand the grave. And what he says is that the grave, no, notice, and, and I've gone over this other times with you, but there's a happy side in verse 23, being in torment in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham, there's another person named, afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom, and, and if you... Uh, Notice in verse 31, another person is named Moses. So this is an atypical, if it's a parable, it's atypical. So basically, in the grave, there are two compartments. There, I call it the happy side and the unhappy side, okay? And the unhappy, it says they're in torments, but they can see each other across here, but there's a great gulf fixed, and you can't get back and forth. This place is called Abraham's bosom. And what happens is, if, if you go to a little bit further in Luke, look, look in Luke, now see, I never know you guys are coming out, know just where this is, but in Luke, uh, today you'll be with, ah, 2343. Look what Jesus says to the thief on the cross. This is fascinating to me, uh, connecting all these dots. In Luke 23, what did they say it was, 43, Jesus is hanging on the cross next to a, uh, a convicted, guilty, rabble-rousing murderer and thief uh, that's hanging there, crucified with him. And this thief calls out to the Lord and is saved. And Jesus says to him, today you will be with me in paradise. It appears that what Jesus did is Jesus took him with him. And it says uh, in, in uh, Psalm, um, let's see, uh, lead captivity captive. It's quoted in uh, Ephesians 4. Uh, Jesus, it appears, went down and proclaimed, as Peter says, Let's go to Ephesians 4. I'll show you exactly what happens. Um, ah, it's right in the beginning of Ephesians 4. Uh, Therefore, he says, verse 8, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this, that he ascended, verse 9, what does it mean but that he also descended first to the lower parts of the earth? He who descended, and what is all that? Well, it appears, if you tie that together with what Peter said, that from the cross, Jesus went like this. Jesus is crucified, between the two thieves, and uh, he tells this guy, you're going to go with me to paradise. Jesus goes down to the grave here. He proclaims a cross to the lost and to the further reaches where there's uh, these demons that are kept in jail down in the pit. Jesus proclaims that he won, and he empties this side and takes them with him to before his father to paradise. Now, they, they do not yet have their bodies. Now we come back to, to one of your uh, questions. Um, right there. Uh, bodies are not given to us until our celestial bodies, until 1 Thessalonians 4. So let's, let's go to 1 Thessalonians 4, your verse that you mentioned. And this is what Paul says, uh, 4.16. Um, got to back up, 4.16. It starts in 13. I don't want you to be ignorant concerning those who have fallen asleep. Uh, euphemism for death. Less you, remember Jesus said Lazarus sleeps. Lazarus was dead. Sleeping is, it's not soul sleep. It's death. Uh, the body dies. The soul does not sleep. The body is sleeping in the ground. In fact, just one more thing to, to, um, to come on. How do I get my, uh, oh, there it is. Let me get my special page. Um, the word sleep 
is koimeo, a sleeping place came into English as koimetary, or we in English say cemetery, but that's actually a sleeping place. After Christianity, cemeteries began to be called sleeping places for bodies because they're going to rise. Before Christianity, they were called necropolises, necropolis, a city of dead, because they didn't believe in resurrection. And, and so dead people were in cities before Christ. After Christ, bodies were sleeping. This is the word sleep. And so sleeping places for bodies. So what it says right here in Ephesians 4, or I mean in 1 Thessalonians 4 is, um, for if we believe Jesus died, verse 14, rose again, even so the, uh, God will bring with him, bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. They're not, verse 14, they're not um, down somewhere in the pit anymore. See, this, they're not down here anymore. Those who believe are with him. Um, but here's where they get their bodies. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first, and then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. Does it say anything about the bodies? No. Paul enlarges on that in 1 Corinthians 15. So now back up to the left in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 15, and notice what it says. 1 Corinthians 15, uh, verse 50. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, so our bodies can't go to heaven like they are. Nor does corruption inherit incorruption. I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Every time I read that verse, that's the theme verse of our nurseries here at Calvary. They don't sleep in there, but we always change them. <laughs> Did you know you always have to say that? But uh, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. That's not about the nursery. For some of you are puzzled. Uh, that was a joke. Uh, we won't all die, he's saying in verse 51, but we'll all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of the eye, at the last trump, for the trump will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this, verse 53, this corruptible must put on incorruption, this mortal must put on in immortality, and on and on he goes. So, what's happening is, uh, Jesus emptied, the, the, the redeemed side of the grave. He took them uh, with him to paradise. So Jesus uh, calls heaven the paradise of God in Revelation. So he took the thief with him to paradise and they are all there, but they are uh, spirits without bodies. You say, what, what, what are we talking about there? Now, now look at what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians 5. So go to the right a little bit. Um, starting, well, he starts in verse 1. For we know that if our earthly house, that's our body, this tent is destroyed, we have a building from God. He's talking about our celestial, our eternal bodies. Uh, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. If indeed we have been clothed, we will not be found naked. For if we are in this tent, we groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality might be swallowed up by life. And you kind of get lost after a while. I mean, it's just, it, Paul is talking about so many truths. But look what he says. Um, Verse 6, we're always confident knowing that while we are at home in this body, while you and I are alive in our bodies, we are absent from the Lord. Verse 8, we are confident, yea, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. And so what, what Paul says, going back to your original question, um, when we're absent from our body, the instant of death. If we're a believer, we're instantly present. First Cor or Second Corinthians five, six through eight says we're instantly present with the Lord. And so, 
for believers, there is no soul sleep. Now, for example, the Roman Catholic Church teaches that people that are not baptized or, I don't know, I'm not a good Roman Catholic, but they have, they have two limbos, actually. Uh, they have limbus infantum, they call it. That's for, sounds like what it is for. It's for infants. These are for babies that weren't baptized. They go to limbus infantum. Then there's uh, limbus patrum, and that's for patrums, whatever those are. Now, that's for people, I don't know how they do it, but they go to limbo. You've probably heard it. If you went to Catholic school, you heard of, oh, they're in limbo. And what that is is, to the Catholics, this is heaven, and on the periphery of heaven is limbus. Now, where do they get all that stuff? It's not in the Bible. They just, they just, I don't know, theologians, they had too many theologians over the centuries in those monasteries and stuff thinking, and they thought of a lot of stuff that wasn't in the Bible. They should have gotten out of the monastery and taught the Bible or something. But this idea of limbus and this, this place of limbo led other denominations. Now we have entire denominations in America that teach soul sleep. And what they say is that the instant you die, you go into this kind of unconscious existence, kind of like uh, the people that get their bodies frozen, you know, and are waiting to, for technology to resurrect them or something like that. No. All that's false science fiction stuff, limbo, soul sleep. God says this, we never cease to exist. Once, we're, we're, once we enter this world, we're immortal. And either at the instant of death, we're absent from the body and present with the Lord, or we go to this pit, and by the way, uh, all people that have ever lived on this earth, Cain, Nimrod, all the way through all the bad guys uh, of all the Egyptian and Assyrian people, all of them we see in Ezekiel 32. You want to see something interesting? Have I ever taken you to Ezekiel 32? You ought to go back to Ezekiel 32. Everybody that's ever lived on this planet is still alive, conscious. Every one of them. The cannibals, the aborigines, Genghis Khan, Adolf Hitler, Cain, everyone. Everyone that, that got drowned in the flood. They're all still alive. And it says in, in Ezekiel 32, it starts talking about, starting in verse 18, Son of man, wail over the multitude of Egypt. Cast them down to the depths of the earth. Her and the nations of the famous na nations with those who go down to the, what does verse 18 of, uh, of Ezekiel 32 say? What's that word? Pit. Notice how many times it's in there. Look at verse 23. Her graves are set in the recesses of the pit. Her company is all around her grave. You go to verse 24, Elam. Elam? Elam is... is it's where the Kurds live today. It's, it's a place, that, a geographic place. Uh, but there used to be Elamites that lived there. And all those Elamites uh, are slain, fallen with the sword, verse 24, and they go to the lower parts of the earth. At the end of verse 24, they bear their shame with those that go down to the pit. Verse 25, with those that go down to the pit. Now look at verse 27. They do not lie with the mighty the, who are fallen, the uncircumcised who have gone down to hell with their weapons of war. They have lain their swords in their heads, but their iniquities will be on their bones. Do you know what? Do you know what happens? Everybody that goes to the grave without Christ goes to this very unhappy place that the rich man was at where he was in pain because their sins go with them. And it's like all through life we're piling up these sins. And... and Actually, the picture here is it's like an avalanche. It's like a snowball. We go through life, and the sins get bigger and bigger. And when we die, we plummet downward, coated, covered with our sins, and go to this pit, conscious. And, and look, when other people come, um, the, it, it talks about the, the, if you read this whole chapter, it's so interesting that some of the people kind of get up to see who's coming down now. This isn't hell. This is the holding tank. This is the pit. This is the grave. 
This is the, the unhappy side where people are in great discomfort, but they're waiting the final judgment. That's for the lost, but for the saved. But, but when, when did this happen? Well, this is where, and I started talking this two weeks ago. Look at now one last verse, and then I'll tie it all up. Look at Hebrews 11, the very last verse. The people, the people in the happy side couldn't get out of the happy side. Hebrews 11 says, Abraham had to wait there. Moses had to wait there. That's, that Job had to wait there. Abel, righteous Abel, had to wait there. They couldn't get out of that happy side until the last verse of chapter 11. And, and um, it says this in verse 40 of Hebrews 11. God having provided something better for us, that they, who's that? That's all these righteous people that, that are before Christ. They should not be made perfect apart from us. When Christ finished on the cross, uh, that's when Jesus, where's that drawing? Uh, where Jesus, there, whoop, there it was, we went right by it. When Jesus finished his work on the cross, he went down to the happy side, proclaimed his victory, and took all of those uh, with him, with the rich, I mean the thief, to paradise. Now the, the problem with this is that there, there is a notion that, that the Old Testament saints are going to be waiting for some future resurrection. But Jesus said, no, no, no. He said, today, Mr. Old Testament saint, thief dying on the cross, today you're going to be with me in this paradise. And so, uh, well, that's a long answer, but let me just get, what was, what was the question? <laughs> Let's go back, if I can find, oh. Come on. There. No soul sleep. Instantly absent from the body, present with the Lord. Everybody can hear Christ's voice. Jesus calls the bodies out of the grave. 2 Corinthians 5 says we're absent from the body and present with the Lord. Uh, Ecclesiastes says that our body goes down, but our spirit goes to our creator, and, and he consigns uh, the righteous to the happy side and the unrighteous to the sad side. And Job said, I know that my Redeemer lives, uh, if you remember um, 1923, and that in my flesh I, I will see God. So the idea of a resurrection, a resurrection body was always in the scriptures, but they didn't understand what was going on until the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Thessalonians 4 showed us a mystery and he explained all this. And there's one um, last verse that's real fascinating about this and that is when, when Saul, die, uh, Saul went to the witch and Samuel had already died. Do you remember that in chapter 30 of 1 Samuel? And the witch at Endor did a seance and she was used to this. She, she was paid People would pay her to do a seance, and she worked with all these demons, because demons will tell you anything you want to hear. And they know everything, by the way. Demons know everything, because they, they are in uh, indestructible spirits that, that can speak every language and go through walls. So they hear everything. They see everything. They know every language. So you can call a demon up to impersonate anybody. And she calls up her demons, and all of a sudden screams, if you read it. Why? A demon didn't come up. Samuel himself came up. She'd never seen a person, a real one. Because it says in the Bible, remember the rich man of Lazarus says, nobody can cross, nobody can come back. You just can't come back whenever you want. Demons can't pull you back. And Samuel, it says, came up from beneath. He came from the happy side of Hades. He came from that that grave place where every righteous person was in that waiting room with Abraham and the rest. But Samuel was brought up and talked to Saul and went back down. And then out of that place also, Jesus met with Elijah who, who had been translated and with Moses. And they came and stood on the Mount of Transfiguration 
And then they had to go back and wait until Hebrews 11, until the cross was finished. So, hey, that was fun. Thanks. Uh,